hold on to a good conscience. This is just beautiful, amazing advice from the Apostle Paul. Psychologists today, I was reading about this this week, believe that one of the most important things about your mental health is having a good conscience, is living with a good conscience, living with no regret, living without shame. That some, in some way, it's interesting, even psychologists there are saying, we're, we're not wired as people to be able to handle shame. That shame degrades your mental health, your mental state of being. And so here Paul is saying to Timothy, live with a good conscience, hold on to it, guard it. Do what it takes to be able to have a good conscience. The title of the message is called Trained, Devoted, and Consecrated. A people who are trained, devoted, and consecrated. Well, this is the beginning of really a new season. We've come out of Mark, we're in Timothy. Uh, children go back to school tomorrow. Woo! Praise Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> it's exciting. Listen, in the earlier services, women got so excited, they were writing second tie checks. I mean, they were just like worshiping God. And so we're so glad that school is starting and our children can be in their rightful place in the world. Uh, you know, uh, also we have a, with the beginning of school is a new football season is upon us. Uh, prediction, the Cowboys will probably go 12 and three or 15 and 0 in the regular season and then promptly lose the first game of the playoffs. <laughs> Tends to be the pattern and I'm sure that's probably going to happen once again. But also in good news in the world of football, the University of Texas and Texas A&M are once again playing each other in the regular season. So the universe has been put right in order once again. We're grateful for that. And uh, we have a men's meeting on Friday night. Gentlemen, I want you to join me to be here because Pastor Joe has a very special message for every man in the church. I want you to hear it. I want you to be a part of it. It's a very important gathering right here at this campus on Friday night. I have an opening question for you. Here's my question. I want you to ponder this. In what part of your life are you well-trained and devoted? What part of your life are you well-trained and devoted. For example, you may be a car buff. You know everything about a certain type of car and you really understand cars. You're very well trained in cars. It's a hobby, it's, it's, it's your, your car buff. Maybe you're a fantasy football freak and the, the, the beginning of fantasy football for you is just like something super exciting and, and uh, almost something that's religious for you. My, my son Heston is uh, really into fantasy football. He's really good at it. So I play fantasy football uh, here at the church with a group of guys. And so I'm constantly calling him, asking him for advice. What do I do? And he laughs and then tells me what to do. And it usually pays off. Um, maybe it's your career. Maybe you're highly skilled in your career and you have a high level of expertise. It could be, ladies, it could be with fashion. You really know a lot about fashion. You're, you're well-trained in that discipline. Well, if we were to ask the Apostle Paul the same question, here's what I think his answer would be. The Apostle Paul, my passion is for the church to become a well-trained, deeply devoted, and highly consecrated community. Amen. I think this is Paul's passion. I think if we ask Paul the same question, that this is what he would say. And thus, this is why Paul writes 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Now, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are typically called the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters because Paul is writing to these two pastors, Timothy and Titus, that he's trained up and discipled to be able to be pastors. And he's, he's writing to them. Really, they probably could be called the mentoring letters as Paul is mentoring these young men into what it takes to lead a church, to be the people of God. 
Paul gives us an uh, insight into the state of his mind when we read 1 Timothy. He's, uh, he's at a place where he's trying to establish his theological vision for the churches. He's making really his final appeal. Paul realizes he's at the end of his race. It's time for him to hand the baton off to the next generation, to Timothy and Titus. It's a touchy moment. He realizes he's at the end of his race and that baton can't be dropped like the Americans did the other night in the four by 100, which we tend to do for the past five Olympics. Uh, it can't be dropped. It cannot be dropped. And Paul feels that anxiety. He feels the anxiety of this. It's in him. You can feel it when you read 1 Timothy. You can feel Paul's anxiety. You can also feel his confidence. He's, he's confident in Timothy and Titus. He's confident that he's discipled them well, that the power of God is upon them, but he's anxious. Then we can feel Paul's personal warmth for both of these men. He's, he's deeply connected to these men. In fact, Timothy he has a deep connection with because in his first missionary journey, when Paul was passing through Liberia, he, he probably won Timothy to Christ, probably led him to Christ. Paul knows Timothy's mother and grandmother, and Paul's been involved with Timothy's life at, from a very early age until this point to where Paul is really Timothy's spiritual father. So he has a sense of responsibility for Timothy. Then he also realizes that he's sending Timothy to, to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is a very unique place, very unique in the ancient world. Ephesus was admired by ancient authors as the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. It was also called the light of Asia or the market of Asia because it was located on the sea and also in land. You can see that Ephesus right there in the middle, it was a major trading route in the ancient world. So it was very influential when it comes to uh, the atmosphere of the ancient world. It was a very important military city. It was an important city for trade. And it was a very important city for culture. The city was adorned with magnificent amphitheater, with aqueducts, a gymnasium, a massive stadium, impressive gates, and a beautiful Roman basilica. At the time Paul is writing this letter, there are over 200,000 people who are living in this city called Ephesus, and that means that Ephesus is second only to Rome and Alexandria in both size and grandeur. Ephesus is a major player in the ancient world. The religious culture in Ephesus is fascinating and probably the most unique in the ancient world. Ephesus boasted five major temples. There was a temple to Zeus, a temple to Apollo, a temple to Roma, a temple to Augustus Caesar. Augustus decided that he was not going to wait until he passed away for him to have a temple. He wanted to be worshiped while he was still alive, and so he had a temple constructed to himself in Ephesus. <laughs> But by far, the most influential temple in the city, by far, there's no comparison. By far, the most influential and powerful temple in the city of Ephesus was the temple to Artemis. This female deity, this female god that the Greeks called Artemis, the Romans called her Diana. Her temple built in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In fact, it's four time, it was four times larger than the, the Parthenon in Athens. It was a beautiful, amazing, massive structure, and it dominated the city. The temple of Artemis was a female-only cult. Only females could be priests at this temple. And there were probably hundreds of them. And this is fascinating, that the female priest of Artemis, one of their roles in the city, one of the roles, not the only, but one of the roles was to make sure that female culture was superior to male culture. One of their roles was to make sure that males were kept in their place, which was a lower status 
within the city than females. This was one of the roles of worshiping Artemis. This was one of the things that they felt culturally responsible for. The reason is, of course, because Artemis was claimed to be the queen of heaven. She was the divine guardian of the city. She was the benefactor of the city. If things went well financially, it was only because of Artemis. And things were going very well financially in Ephesus at the time Paul writes to Timothy. Paul had been to Ephesus multiple times. He had spent about three years doing ministry there, establishing the church. Timothy was likely with Paul on that second missionary journey. When you remember, it's like out of a movie in Acts chapter 19, when Paul is preaching and many come to Christ and people in the city get frustrated. There's the silversmiths. They, they, they make accusations against Paul that he's defaming the great Artemis. And so the people riot. There's a massive riot in the city and they gather together and they go to the amphitheater and they all gather. And in this theater, in fact, we have a picture of where this, this event actually took place. The city gathers and they begin to yell for two hours straight. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, how many of you have been to a sporting event or any type of event where for two hours straight, you yelled at the top of your lungs something like this? Anybody raising the hand? I don't see any hands. Now, over at the other campus, there was a guy who raised his hand, but it's okay. He's from Europe and he's a soccer man. So it's, it's okay. <laughs> we forgive him. But most of us have never done that before. What would possess a people for two hours to vocally yell out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians? Well, let me tell you, the Ephesians gave Artemis three very important things. The Ephesians gave to Artemis sexual worship, financial worship, and cultural worship. They worshiped Artemis in such a way, and if any people give themselves over in those three areas, you are into fanaticism. They were fanatics. That's why they could yell for two hours straight. This is the city which the Apostle Paul is sending his son in the faith to go be a pastor. I'm sure Timothy's saying, well, thanks a lot, Paul. This is great. I'm so excited about starting my ministry here in this city. I'm sure it's gonna go really well where uh, the, all these temples exist and you're expecting me to plant this church. This is the case. This is the scenario that Timothy is facing when Paul is writing to him, mentoring him as a pastor. So let's jump in verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the command of God our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ our hope to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Paul's greeting here is this. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now in almost all Paul's letters, he opens up with this greeting, but this one's different. In all the other epistles, Paul says grace and peace to you. He pronounces this blessing upon the congregation that he's writing to, grace and peace to you. But to the epistles uh, to, to Timothy and Titus, it's different. He adds the word mercy because he knows they're gonna need it. He adds the word mercy. So he says grace, mercy, and peace to you. This is interesting. Grace means this. It means receiving blessings that we do not deserve. If God's grace is upon your life, you're receiving blessings that you don't deserve. Mercy means this, not receiving the curses that we do deserve. When God's mercy is upon your life, the curses that you and I deserve, we don't receive. Jesus has dealt with them. And then lastly, the peace. Peace means the joy of knowing that God is standing right next to you. Could you imagine in your darkest financial moment, knowing the peace of God, 
that God is standing right there with you in that dark time. In your most difficult relational moment, when it looks like everything is breaking down and there is no hope, knowing that God is standing right there with you and you can be at peace. This is the pronouncement that Paul wants Timothy and Titus to give to their congregation. This is the gift that he wants the people of God to have. Grace, mercy, and peace. Verse three, as I urge you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, Timothy. <laughs> stay there, please. I know it's hard, but stay there so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Verse eight, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is not for the righteous, but for the law breakers and rebellious, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mother, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he has entrusted to me. Verse 12, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he has considered me trustworthy and appointed me to his service. Even though, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out abundantly upon me along with faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. And then verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying deserving of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Here the apostle Paul calls himself the worst of sinners. I've always wondered how this could be. I remember reading this when I was a little kid in Sunday school and thinking about, well, this is guy, Paul, he's the best Christian there is. I mean, he wrote two thirds of the New Testament. How's, why does he identify himself as the worst of sinners? It's interesting, the progression in the way that Paul describes himself early in his Christian walk. He says this, that he's the least of the apostles who does not even deserve to be called an apostle. So early on, Paul recognizes he is an apostle, but he says, I'm the least. He says, I'm an apostle, but I'm the least. Towards the middle of his career, later on, he says this, I'm less than the least of God's people. So he was an apostle, now he's just one of God's people, but I'm the least of God's people. But then here towards the very end of his life, he says that he's the worst of sinners. Here's the lesson I think that Paul's teaching us, the progression that he goes through, which really is profound for us. As we grow closer to Jesus, as we walk with God, and we realize what Jesus did for us on the cross, the forgiveness of sin that he's provided for us, the power of the new covenant and the blood that washes all of our shame away, we connect and realize how grateful we are that we're saved. Our sin bothers us more than ever before. 
and we recognize we're dependent upon Jesus. This is, Paul went through this progression and he's asking us to do the same. Then in verse 16, but for that reason, what we just described, for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his immense patience as an example to those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Here, Paul is saying that he's an example. I read this passage, this verse 16, 1 Timothy 16 in the Amplified. Here's what it says. Yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example or pattern for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul says that his life is an example. Even beyond that, it's a pattern. The NIV uses example. The New King Jimmy uses the word pattern. And then the Message Bible calls Paul's life an evidence. That my, the life that he lived is an evidence that Jesus really is the Savior. And so I think what Paul's doing here, and he's helping us connect to a very important truth, Paul's identifying with an Old Testament truth. In the Old Testament, God establishes the people of Israel. He picks out a people on the planet that the Bible says are the least of people. There was nothing that would have attracted God to the people of Israel. They were the least of people. And yet God chooses a people to reveal himself to, to give his law to, to give his word to, so that the rest of the world could look at Israel and say, oh, that's what it's like to walk with the king of the universe. That's what it's like to be a people who have a relationship with the creator. That's what it's like to live in the blessings of heaven. That's what it's like to be a part of what Jesus prayed, that heaven and earth would come together and that there would be a people who live where heaven and earth are one. That's what the Old Testament people were supposed to be like. That's what Israel was supposed to be an example. And Paul is saying, that's me now. That now I, my life is to be an example. And now what Paul's telling us is that's the same for you and I. That we here at Trinity are supposed to be a community of people, a community of the people of God that live so closely with God that other people outside the community look at us and say, I'd love to go to lunch with them, especially if they pay. <laughs> I would love to hang around those people. I wanna go to their small group. I wanna go to their men's gathering as all the men right now pull out their phone and sign up for the men's gathering. I wanna be a part of what's happening with these people. Because we're supposed to be an example that the world can look at as a pattern, as an evidence that Jesus' words are true. Then verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 18, the last few verses of this chapter. Timothy, my son. Here's that language again. Here's Paul pouring himself out to Timothy as a spiritual father. Here's the warmth. Here's the Paul giving us insight into the way he feels. I'm giving you this command with the prophecies once made about you. Prophecy is very important in the church. There had been prophecies that were given to Timothy that Paul knew about. We're not exactly sure who they came from. They could have come from Paul himself. But Timothy had been prophesied over in the church. And Paul was saying, I want you to remember those prophecies. Those prophecies are extremely important. You're in Ephesus. This is gonna be one of the most difficult cities on the planet to have a church in. You're gonna to need to stand on those words that have been given to you. I want you to remember those prophecies. Russell Ann and I have tried to make a practice in our uh, church life that whenever, we've received several prophecies through the years. 
We try to capture them, write them down, capture them in our Bible, and we try to remember them over and over again. And we try to let them define us, wash over us. We try to make sure that we're standing on those prophecies. Just as Paul told Timothy, remember these things that have been prophesied about you. We try to live the same way. So that by recalling them, watch this, Paul says, by recalling the prophecies that have been spoken over to you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Hold on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so suffer shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymas and Alexander, of whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but I don't want to be in their small group. I don't want to be around those guys. They're shipwrecked. If the Apostle Paul says, hey, man, I've handed them over to Satan, I ain't hanging out with those guys. And you know what? You probably don't need to either. We need to find the people of God that encourage us in the things of God. So Paul says to hold on to three things. I want to take a quick moment and look at these three things that Paul, the language here in the Greek, when Paul says to Timothy, I want you to hold on, it's like someone grabbing a bar where you have to grab it with your full strength, both hands to be able to hold yourself up and maybe even do a chin up. You've got to grab hold of it. You have to lay hold of it. This is the language that Paul is using to Timothy. Three things. One, that you may fight the battle well. You and I are in a battle. We're trying to walk out the things of God, be the people of God in a world that's antithetical to God. There's a battle, a spiritual battle that's happening. Satan, the last thing he wants to see happen is Trinity Church continue being a healthy, vibrant, amazing church That's the last thing he wants to see happen. It's a battle. You and I are fighting a battle. Number two, hold on to faith. Paul says, look, I need you to hold on to the faith. I'm just about gone. I'm I'm passing the baton on. I need you to hold on to this faith because generation after generation after generation is dependent upon you holding on to the faith. And then thirdly, he says this, hold on to a good conscience. This is just beautiful, amazing advice from the Apostle Paul. Psychologists today, I was reading about this this week, believe that one of the most important things about your mental health is having a good conscience, is living with a good conscience, living with no regret, living without shame, that some, in some way, it's interesting, even psychologists there are saying, we're, we're not wired as people to be able to handle shame. That shame degrades your mental health, your mental state of being. And so here Paul is saying to Timothy, live with a good conscience, hold on to it, guard it. Do what it takes to be able to have a good conscience. So here's my thought. How do we hold on to these things, these three things? How do you and I grab hold of them and keep hold of these three very important things that Paul lays out to Timothy? Well, first off, to fight the battle, we must be well-trained. We have to be well-trained if we're going to fight the battle. I like to watch on television, I like to watch the documentaries about the Navy SEALs or other highly trained military units. And what's interesting about the SEALs is they're known all over the world as being the most trained, the most effective fighting force on the planet. Why is this? It's because they're very well trained. When you watch the shows and all that they go through, like I think it's, they have to sit in cold water for six hours and they get out and they're shaking, I'm watching this going, I thank God that's not me. I mean, (laughs) you watch what they go through, but you know what it means? It means they're well-trained. They can be sent to do a task that no one else on the planet can do. They're well-trained. 
to hold on to faith, we must be deeply devoted. We have to be a people, if we're gonna hold on to faith in the culture in which we live, we've gotta be a people that's deeply devoted to a personal walk with Jesus. Deeply devoted to scripture. Deeply devoted to a prayer life. Deeply devoted to a small group, a a community of people that can hold me accountable and help me see blind spots in my life. We have to be a deeply devoted people if we're gonna hold on to faith. And then lastly, to hold on to a good conscience, we must be highly consecrated. If we're gonna live mentally healthy lives, if we're going to be whole people, The Bible says that we have to be highly consecrated, highly set apart for the things of God, highly dedicated to our relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Highly consecrated. It means that you recognize within you there's a sacredness to your soul. That in your soul you are sacred before God. You are holy before the Lord. You are God's treasured possession. And so you're gonna live highly consecrated in order to be able to hold on to a good conscience. Here's what I wanna do in conclusion before we have our ministry time. In just a moment, Pastor Matthew's gonna be up here and he's gonna call our ministry team forward. And I want you to be able to take advantage of this moment. Because I have three questions that I want you to honestly engage with. And in fact, what I would like to ask you to do is ask the Holy Spirit to answer these three questions for you. And then based on your response, I want you to take an action with those. Here's the first question. Are you well-trained? Do you really feel like you're well-trained in the scriptures? Are you well-trained in what it means to have a prayer life? Well-trained in what it means to be committed to a community, a small community, a a small group of people that you meet with and share your life with and and suffer with and and fellowship with? Are you well-trained in the things of God? Now look, if you're at the beginning of your Christian walk, well, the answer would probably be no, and and that's completely understandable. Or maybe you've been walking for a Christian is a long time, and just you've never really felt challenged to be well-trained. This is your moment, and I don't want you to lose it. Because we have some people that will pray with you at the end of the service. We can help you become well-trained. And then secondly, are you deeply devoted? Are you deeply devoted. Would someone describe you as a deeply devoted person to Jesus? Would, if I asked your spouse, hey, is he or she deeply devoted to the things of God? What would he or she say? What would the Holy Spirit say? Are you deeply devoted? Now, sometimes maybe you haven't grown up in a tradition or a church where devotion was a priority. You've never maybe been taught how to be deeply devoted. How do I have a quiet time? How do I read the scriptures and understand them for myself? How do I have a devotional life? We have people that are gonna come up here and pray with you in just a moment. I want you to take advantage of it. And lastly, the third question is this. Are you highly consecrated? Are you highly consecrated? Do you see yourself as being highly consecrated? consecrated unto the Lord? Is your soul something that you guard and keep holy before Jesus? Do you practice a high level of consecration, which means to be separated from the world, separated from the things that pull us away from God, separated from the demonic realm that seeks to draw us into trash? Are you a highly consecrated person. This is Paul's vision for the church. This is Paul's vision for the people of God, that we would be well-trained, that we would be deeply devoted, and that we would be highly consecrated. And I want you to take advantage of this moment today. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. Pastor Matthew's going to be here, and I want you to take advantage 
of what God has spoken to you. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this amazing church and what you're doing here at Trinity. Lord, the vision that you gave Pastor Joe and Pastor Nancy all those years ago is still in operation today. And so Father, I pray that everyone would respond today to what you've spoken to them. There may be an area of their life that they realize I'm not consecrated, I, I'm not well-trained, I'm, I'm not devoted. And Lord, today, I'm, at, I'm just asking that they would take action on that. And Lord, that we as a community, that we would become that church that Paul envisioned, that church that Jesus is calling us to be, the people of God that live with you in such a way that people look at us and say, I want to be with you. Lord, we're asking this today in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Excellent, excellent. Way to get us started, First Timothy, Pastor Derek. Am I well trained? Am I deeply devoted? Am I highly consecrated? I'm going to continue to ask myself those questions, and I encourage you to do the same thing as this day wears on and into the new week. And I also want to encourage you to read First Timothy chapter 2 in preparation for the word that Pastor Joe is going to be bringing us yeah. next, next week. week yeah. Let's all stand together. Are you glad you came to church today? Maybe not after that challenging word, but we <laughs> sure are glad that you came to church today. And since you came, why don't you go ahead and take your worship guide with you? This is the key. It's got the QR codes. It's got the links and the information about how you can get more connected here at Trinity Church and grow as a disciple. This does change from week to week. It may look the same on the outside, but it's new on the inside, just like some of us, right? So take this with you and make sure you take advantage of the things that are held inside. Minister team, if you'll please come on up to the front. Our small group leaders, our ministry leaders, we are available to pray for you. The Bible says that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives much grace to the humble. If you're stuck, if you need help, if you're in a situation that you can't get out of and your own way hasn't fixed it for you yet, it's time to ask God for help. It's time to ask for some of these leaders to pray for you. Therein is the secret. If you just humble yourself, God will pour out all the grace that you need. And that's one of the reasons we like to make ourselves available. It's not because we have our act together, we know everything, but we represent you humbling yourself and asking God for help. Help us help you. We wanna pray for you and encourage you. And when God sees, okay, they've sufficiently humbled themselves, he's like, okay, good, finally, I could do something here in this situation. He's gonna pour out the grace in whatever situation you need, relational, financial, healing, whatever it is, we wanna pray for you. So these leaders are ready and willing to do that. And with that said, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to cause his face to shine upon you and give you joy and peace and rest, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, everyone. And we will see you next week for 1 Timothy chapter 2.